una definición reciente por parte de la Comisión Europea afirma que la participación digital ayuda a la gente a involucrarse en la política y eh, también en la elaboración de las políticas y facilita la comprensión de estos eh, procesos gracias a las tecnologías de la información y de la comunicación, las TIC. Por su parte, Naciones Unidas eh, lo define como el proceso de implicar a los ciudadanos a través de las TIC en la política, la toma de, de decisiones, el diseño y la ejecución de modo que sea un proceso participativo, inclusivo y deliberativo. Estos son los elementos que resaltan. También podemos decir que la participación digital tiene tres funciones clave. La monitorización, el diseño de la agenda y la contribución a la toma de decisiones. Además, también se puede decir que implica la, inter la interacción a tres bandas entre la ciudadanía, la administración pública y los políticos. Por eso, es verdad que este, este término está, está igualmente muy asociado tanto al eh, gobierno electrónico eh, como a la democracia eh, electrónica, aunque este término es mucho más amplio y queríamos acotar un poco más. En todo caso, lo dejamos ahí, es eh, algo que se puede ir eh, debatiendo y, y deliberando más, eh, más adelante. Y por último, simplemente deciros que eh, hoy vamos a centrarnos en las herramientas e eh, iniciativas de participación ciudadana en el seno de las instituciones europeas, pero tenemos planteado hacer una segunda sesión más adelante, a principios de año probablemente, en el que abordaremos la participación ciudadana desde las iniciativas y los recursos que ponen eh, a disposición o que están creando eh, desde fuera, desde las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, y ahí también eh, contaremos con la participación de distintos proyectos y entre ellos algunos eh, proyectos beneficiarios de nuestro programa Europa con los Ciudadanos. Y bien, no me extiendo más, doy ya la palabra a mi, a mi colega Philip para lanzar la primera pregunta. Yes, so to kick off our first uh, presentation, we are actually uh, inviting you to, to Slido and to a first poll. We would like to ask you which are the instruments of EU participation you have already used or you have come across, let's say, uh, documents uh, is the channel that is leading, followed by contacting institutions. Uh, voting in the elections comes third so far. Just uh, some words of introduction to just to explain where I speak from, so to speak. Uh, I work in the European Commission uh, managing the Europe for Citizens program and through this program we support um, active citizenship and democratic participation which means that in our portfolio of projects we have many uh, examples of, of uh, active participation including through, uh, through a participation. Just to, to zoom in as it were a bit on the, on the topic of today for uh, for the union for the european union the issue of uh, uh, e-participation is uh, really uh, crucial for from a democratic uh, viewpoint and the stakes couldn't be higher because i mean the issue of uh, participation is important for every level of governance arguably the local level the regional level the national level but also very much uh, for the EU level, because uh, in this proverbial uh, search, you know, for a, a European demos, uh, the need for the use of uh, electronic participation tools, as have been uh, eloquently uh, defined by, by Carolina, are, are essential uh, when you talk about a transnational, uh, multicultural, political uh, body the uh, the need to use e-participation uh, tools um, is is really um, is really obvious. E-participation is also a must nowadays in in every uh, democracy and at every democratic level. But it's it's really um, essential for for the European level of uh, of governance. I will really do. Uh, I will focus on on very few uh, few elements um, this afternoon and perhaps distinguishing three basic uh, functions, uh, let's say, uh, uh, of, um, of e-participation. I will talk about information, 
then a consultation and then decision making and, and review a bit the tools that are available to uh, either you know, citizens or organized civil society, let's say, to, to participate uh, electronically uh, in, the, uh, in the European democracy. Information first. Uh, talking about information may sound uh, a bit uh, basic. Indeed, uh, information is the bare minimum uh, that uh, that citizens can expect from uh, um, public administrations or, or public institutions, including uh, European um, European institutions. But it is a precondition for for e participation. So uh, uh, information and transparency of the EU institution is part of e-participation to the extent that it enables monitoring by, uh, by citizens of what the uh, EU institutions are, are doing. Uh, I would argue that uh, the policy on transparency uh, and uh, uh, access to information by EU uh, institutions uh, is, is quite developed and, uh, and is probably uh, uh, among, let's say, the, the, the highest standards across, uh, across the Union. For instance, the access to document legal regime is uh, arguably uh, among the most liberal uh, regimes of uh, access to documents across the, the continent. Uh, the uh, open data policy of the EU institutions is quite advanced huh? as part of the, the digital single market agenda. The, the Commission, the EU institutions are pushing really uh, quite, quite forcefully an access to, to public data and is applying to itself this, um, this agenda. Uh, of course, of course, the, the situation is uh, not perfect. Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, access of uh, citizens to deliberations in uh, council working groups, for instance, is often uh, criticized, as is the possible access of citizens to the final legislative deliberations between the council and the parliament in, in trilogue. So there remain some areas in which uh, information is not perfect and uh, doesn't allow a full and, and complete uh, control by citizens. But by and large, I would say that, uh, that the information and uh, transparency policy of EU institutions is quite, quite developed. Um, a subtopic of the information issue uh, for the uh, EU institutions and access electronically to, to information, of course, at the European level, is the issue of multilingualism. That's an added uh, difficulty. Huh? Uh, beyond the principle that citizens should be able to contact and receive a response from any institution in any of the EU official languages, um, we all know that, for instance, uh, websites uh, are still uh, unfortunately dominated by, um, by some languages. So the, the situation is, um, is not perfect there either. But still, the principle is, uh, is there. Uh, the, uh, the web pages of the, of the Union are uh, fairly accessible in, um, in uh, all languages. Information can always be uh, requested in one's language, which means that uh, uh, any citizen can request information in her or his uh, language. So uh, accessibility is an issue, but uh, let's say there is a conscious effort on the side of the EU institutions to, to try to, to enable uh, accessibility. There's the issue of going beyond what I've just said, beyond the official journal, so to speak. And uh, here I would say that uh, EU institutions have been gearing up towards an active e-information policy, which means that it's not enough to, to be able to pretend that in some corner of, um, of a complex uh, website, one could find the information to, uh, you know, to feed uh, the, the democratic uh, debate. The issue is to uh, package it, as it were, to make it understandable and usable 
to uh, to citizens and uh, nowadays the agora uh, particularly for discussions at the uh, at the european level is an electronic uh, agora uh, and the, the agora are uh, social media for better or for worse you know there are many issues related to this and that, that will be the debate of another conversation i guess but uh, be that as it may the, the eu institutions need to adapt to this and have adapted to this so now you have a, a more active uh, and very active i would even say a social media policy of the eu uh, institutions for instance i could mention the example of the uh, viral uh, campaign of the european parliament ahead of the the last uh, elections let's say uh, they, they decided to have a, a much more um, active uh, campaign in the run-up to uh, to the uh, to the elections another example i could mention is uh, the campaign called les decodeurs by the uh, european commission representation in in france which is a fake news debunking active uh, campaign um, by uh, by the representation of um, of the commission in france to let's say, contribute in a way to to the discussion and and provide uh, to, to citizens uh, the the uh, the opinion of the institutions to to debunk some some news last point on uh, information is the uh, direct uh, contact with the uh, elected uh, representative uh, and and politicians let's say that's that can be done by uh, by chatting uh, or having a contact with the uh, your uh, member of the european parliament and uh, nowadays it's pretty easy in a way to to have a sort of e interaction with a, with a member of the european parliament uh, either through um, twitter facebook um, the uh, the politicians the elected officials they are nowadays uh, quite reachable through electronic means and that's that's e participation uh, at the at the commission what the uh, commissioners do are uh, or high officials do are uh, citizens dialogue i don't know if some of you have uh, participated to this but uh, now uh, due to covid they are increasingly going online and um, that's probably a feature that's here to stay even beyond the uh, the epidemic situation president von der, von der leyen uh, on her side has been increasingly doing live chat lately so that's part of uh, what informing is all is about and that allows direct e participation by citizens with uh, all the levels of the uh, eu institutions second point then you know, going deeper so to speak in uh, in the field of e participation is a more active participation to what the eu institutions are doing and that's the issue of, of consultation. Uh, consulting citizens or stakeholders uh, is not uh, a novelty. Um, this was done, let's say, long before by uh, organizing, you know, uh, contacts with all possible stakeholders the uh, european institutions and the, the european commission particularly over the past i mean it's more than a decade eh? uh, over the past 20 years has been increasingly refining uh, its uh, its policy in this respect uh, that was part of a, a policy called you know better regulation the need to incorporate consultation of all possible stakeholders including you know all citizens before uh, designing any new policy any new piece of uh, of legislation and that's uh, very much the case now through the the portal called eu have you say it was called before your voice in europe anybody can participate to the um, to the shaping uh, of uh, new uh, policies or, or new pieces of uh, legislation um, okay admittedly sometimes the consultation uh, uh, span uh, can be quite limited you know several weeks you know eight weeks or 12 weeks 
there are known uh, limitations uh, to uh, to the consultation uh, also for instance uh, one frequent uh, criticism of um, electronic consultations on, on for instance on pieces of uh, legislation is that it gives way to a possible capture of the debate by lobbies or, or, or whatnot in any case to look let's say the positive side of things nowadays it is totally uh, a, a principle a firm principle that any uh, new policy any new uh, piece of legislation uh, is preceded by an electronic consultation of uh, any uh, possible stakeholder uh, across the, the union and this consultation of citizens so it is systematic for anything that is in the work program of the European Commission, but it is also now commonplace for wider projects. And here comes the issue of the conference on the, on the future of Europe, uh, on which uh, Daniela will, will give much more uh, uh, details on. Also building on the very recent uh, experience uh, of let's say consultations of citizens on uh, on the future of europe the uh, the initiative that had been uh, launched by um by president macron uh, a couple of years ago third level i would say is uh decision making the tools that are there to enable stakeholders or you know citizens electronically to participate in a way or to stimulate eu decision making at, at the European uh, level. Um, as uh, mentioned by uh, Philippe, for instance, there's the, the tool of the, uh, the petition to the European Parliament. It is an often, let's say, uh, less known instrument, but it can be uh, effective. Uh, quite strikingly, for instance, uh, this, this very Monday, uh, I was having a, a discussion with um, an Irish uh, lady who, it was a decade ago, but she submitted a petition uh, because the, uh, the road close to her home in, uh, in Ireland was in a very poor state. And she managed uh, to, to have something done about it through a petition to, uh, to the European Parliament. So that's, that's a tool uh, that, uh, that would deserve to be, uh, to be better known, you know, any, any citizen can submit a petition to, uh, to the European Parliament to, uh, to stimulate either uh, a policy discussion or, or discussion on a particular situation or topic on any, any subject within the, the competence of the, uh, of the EU. The, then the, uh, this is the most important, arguably, uh, tool uh, for um, associating uh, citizens uh, electronically to, to the EU decision making is the uh, European uh, Citizens Initiative and uh, probably uh, Peter will, uh, will say a word about it because ECAS, uh, his organization is quite heavily involved in, uh, in this. It's the, uh, the European Citizens Initiative. I'm sure that many of you is, um, is aware of it huh, with uh, collecting at least one million signatures um in paper and online hence the, the link to e-participation in at least seven eu countries and we don't leave let's say uh the potential creators of such initiatives uh, uh alone uh in the dark so to speak because um a support system has been created to to help uh, people uh, make concrete use of this uh, participation tool mostly an e-participation tool uh, and that's the, um, the European Cit Citizens Initiative Forum. You know that this week is European Citizens Initiative uh, Week so lots of discussions are, are had uh, about this, uh, this very important tool that has been reformed lately uh, and it's interesting to, uh, to know that the, um, the European uh, Commission has uh, learned the lessons from implementing the sort of first phase of this very important tool that is the, the European Citizens Initiative to, to, to stimulate even um, more uh, initiatives. 
the uh, last uh, tool that I would mention, of course, is um, e-participation around around elections. Of course, uh, the uh, the elections, particularly the European elections, are a very uh, important uh, moment for for the uh, European democracy, and e-participation is key um, at uh, at that time. And uh, increasingly, I, I believe we see um, we see the uh, the European Parliament elections being a topic of the e uh, democracy. Uh, in any case, uh, European uh, Parliament candidates, let's say, increasingly use um, electronic means and uh, and social media as a way to to campaign and to to rally support and to uh, mobilize citizens and um, and supporters. So I mentioned information, consultation, decision making. Uh, I, I would conclude by mentioning the elements of control because uh, in, a, in a democracy, in the European democracy, uh, control, enabling control by, uh, by citizens is almost as important as, uh, as giving uh, way to, to participation. Um, for quite a, a long time, the, the institutions have set up uh, electronic systems to allow an easy uh, complaint system for cases of uh, non-application of EU law or um, infringement of uh, EU law. Uh, so it's very easy to, to submit a complaint if you have a problem of non-implementation of internal market uh, regulations through the system called Solve It. You know, there's a website, you will solve it, and there you will be guided to report uh, an alleged um, breach of implementation of uh, EU law. Same goes for uh, something that doesn't necessarily concern you, but if you see that where you live and EU environmental law doesn't seem to be, uh, to be respected by the national or local level, you can, you know, through a website, and that's e-participation, report uh, what you consider is an infringement of uh, EU law. And that's, that's really uh, user-friendly and, uh, and easy to, uh, to use. You can even uh, suggest simplification or modification of EU legislation through the Fit for Future platform. So if you think that EU law, present EU law, is too complicated to, to be implemented, that's the platform where, uh, where you can uh, submit it. Another example of uh, e-participation. There's the uh, uh, European Ombudsman. So uh, it's got to be used for uh, suspected cases of maladministration by EU institutions. So uh, it deals with the pathology of, uh, of uh, European uh, administration, but uh, still is an, an important institution. Over the, uh, the last years, the, uh, the Ombudsman has been um, an increasingly active um, institution, let's say, in, uh, in Brussels, and uh, has taken um, a very important role in facilitating, um, let's say, access uh, to EU institutions by, uh, by EU citizens. So, I mean, it would deserve it's a development of its own, but just to just to underline that uh, the the European Ombudsman uh, has been a promoter, let's say, of uh, e-participation in the widest meaning of the um, of the word. Uh, what could we say to conclude? I have mentioned too long a list, and I hope it it hasn't been a, a tedious of the different. Uh, tools in the toolbox uh, of the European Union in terms of, uh, of e-participation, but maybe uh, the, right, the right issue is what doesn't exist yet. What are the, the tools that's, that are not there and that would need to be there to, to foster uh, participation through electronic means at, uh, at the EU level? We've got many, many projects uh, dealing with this. We don't shy away from, let's say, trying to expose what we could improve at the European level. For instance, um, 
crowdsourcing legislation at the EU level hasn't been done. And that could be uh, an interesting uh, avenue. It has been done in other countries. You know, the, in Iceland, they have crowdsourced a draft uh, constitution. In France, they, uh, they have crowdsourced uh, digital uh, legislation, and it is done um, in many other places. So that, that could be an avenue. E-budgeting uh, has been done also uh, elsewhere uh, as a tool for participatory uh, budgeting. For the moment, it hasn't been done at the European level, but could be considered and, uh, and envisaged. E-deliberation and e-voting has, uh, has been used recently by the European Parliament in the COVID context, but is, is association of you know, citizens through electronic means to, to some deliberation um, possible at the European level, let's say the the uh, the question could could be um, could be posed. Another relevant aspect is um, what are the conditions and uh, enablers out of the EU institution towards a meaningful e-participation at the EU level, and then there beyond, let's say, uh, the EU institutions uh, or uh, or administration uh, is. Um, the importance of, of civil society, of uh, independent and uh, professional media, of media literacy. Many, many important aspects that we support through uh, the, the, the projects in, uh, within the Europe for Citizens uh, program that are the external checks and balances uh, that are necessary and indispensable to democracy and e-democracy and uh, e-participation uh, alike. Um, I trust that, uh, that Peter and Daniela will uh, elaborate on, uh, on those uh, aspects, or it could be the, the topic of the follow-up uh, webinar. And Gilles, I think it does have to do with uh, what you mentioned at the end, uh, meaning what does not yet exist, and then uh, the question is how can citizens uh, help to shape new instruments? I guess one, one answer could be, well, through all the existing ones, uh, maybe new instruments can also be prepared and, and suggested, but um, here maybe you have some, some other clues for us on, on Thanks. this I'm, On this, I'm tempted to answer that the Conference on the Future of Europe could be the perfect channel and vehicle for mobilization and um, demanding uh, other, other instruments uh, for participation at, uh, at EU level. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Daniela will uh, we talk about this, but uh, this is the, um, uh, the chance of the decade, let's say, to, to weigh in on this uh, debate that will have quasi-constitutional, let's say, uh, dimensions. There is another question, which is more specifically on the Europe for Citizens programs. There's been um, agreement on an increased budget. So, uh, in terms of change, uh, more money uh, is, the, is the first uh, uh, good news. Otherwise, uh, you know, we will have still some continuity with the, the pillars of the Europe for Citizens program as we knew it, let's say, you know, remembrance, network of town, town twinning, civil society projects, both action grants and operating grants. The novelty uh, wanted by the, the co-legislator is the creation of a, of a new strand called Union Values, which will mean uh, support to um, civil society at, really at the grassroots, at the, at the local level. So uh, you can expect uh, more on this. As Philip uh, rightly underlined, we, we don't have the totally final word on, um, on the budget. The legal basis haven't been uh, adopted, so we need to be prudent. But in a nutshell, that's what I described. I'm Petr Markovic. I come from the Citizen, European Citizen Action Service, which is uh, a civil society organization based in Brussels, which will, uh, from January next year, celebrate its 30th anniversary. So we are uh, even older than European citizenship, but more or less they are siblings. As you know, European citizenship was introduced uh, in the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, 
um, and it was introduced as an evolutionary concept by the Spanish uh, government at the time, meaning that the founding idea of introducing European citizenship formally into the treaties uh, was that this concept, EU citizenship, which comes um, as a complement to your national citizenship should evolve. And one of the ways that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic has shown that it has to evolve in is towards a digital EU citizenship. This is something that the president of the commission has also announced in her uh, State of the Union address two months ago or so, saying that she wants a digi digital EU identity for all EU citizens. The way I understood it, and I hope it will pan out, is that all your services that you need to do that in most member states or a large number of member states and local governments you can increasingly do uh, online, remotely, digitally, uh, will now be uh, a part of your European digital identity. So uh, in a way we will dematerialize and digitalize our citizenship. We will be able to be active citizens, not just on the street, but using ICT uh, and these Web2 uh, technologies also, regardless of where we happen to be. Um, today, uh, I will echo some of what uh, Gilles said and try not to take too much of the content that, uh, that uh, Daniela will say. I will take you through a kaleidoscope of uh, e-participation, looking at the three functions that were mentioned by Carolina in the beginning, uh, three levels as much as I can, mainly focusing on the European level, but also touching on the national and local. And just for now, let me say something that uh, has already been an, uh, announced in the announcement for the event, that today we are tackling formal channels of citizen participation, but there will be another session, right, Philip, uh, in January or so, which will actually try to look at informal ways citizens can uh, participate and uh, be active online. Um, and uh, finally, how to boost your EU citizenship in your project will actually be the main goal of my presentation. We heard the definitions. I'm very happy that Carolina and I have used uh, similar sources, uh, but just as a wrap up, let me say that e-democracy, what we call this new exciting um, area of e-democracy, the way I understand it is actually comprised of two dimensions. One is e-government and that one is actually top-down. It is the government trying to digitalize most of its services to citizens and providing in a transparent and effective accessible way services it would it would use to provide physically. But the bottom-up approach is what actually interests us and that is how citizens can be better uh, involved in decision-making uh, which means we want to increase participative democracy through digital means at the EU level. Uh, we've already gone through this with uh, Jules' presentations. There are three ways in terms of intensity of our involvement uh, with the EU through digital means. The weakest one being we are passive recipients of information and we can monitor uh, processes, but still in a fairly passive way. Um, it's more, much better when EU citizens are involved in processes of consultation. What I, as someone who uh, have defended a PhD on e-participation and the European Citizens Initiative can tell you is that even when the commission, for example, since 2000 onwards uh, would frame um, its uh, channels of participation with citizens as a two-way street, as consultation, too often it was actually uh, just uh, marginally consulting citizens, uh, window shopping, lip paying lip service to citizen participation, and in the past really just a couple, uh, not couple, but in the past few years we see that this is changing. We see that the Commission and the Parliament, um, basically anyone aside from the Council, is really trying to engage with citizens, which means we can hope to have active participation. Um, let's put the EU in context, in a global context, shall we? So all the governments, not just the good ones, not just the democratic uh, ones, are digitalizing uh, their 
public spheres and uh, digitalizing ways of interacting with citizens. The bad way of doing it is where uh, you are very close to having uh, Orwell's uh, 1984 novel um, rollout in life is China, Russia is always uh, present in the media as uh, a country that is systematically using uh, social media and uh, digital advances in order to spur panic, uh, misinformation, disinformation, fake news. Um, I all come from Slovenia, but also from Montenegro, and I can tell you that, uh, for example, meme pages on social media have been uh, incredibly successful uh, in shaping the outcome of the last uh, parliamentary elections in that country, which saw the toppling down of uh, a party that has ruled the country for 30 years. So it's not a naive thing uh, to speak about digital democracy at all. Um, what you see in the third pic there is a screenshot of the ECAS or European Citizen Action Services crowdsourcing platform. Uh, Gilles mentioned crowdsourcing in his presentation, basically uh, uh, trying to co-decide with citizens uh, on certain matters using uh, an online platform. And I think that in the European Union, we now have a different kind of uh, relationship between the supply and the demand side on e-participation, basically, uh, for the longest of time, the uh, citizens wanted to be actively engaged, but there was not enough channels uh, that the EU had to offer. Now we have reached a slightly different situation where there are many channels of participation available, also formal ones um, from Brussels and other institutions, but citizens are not actually using these channels and we need to see how to, um, uh, how to make this gap more narrow. Uh, the most successful member state in terms of e-democracy is of course Estonia. They have almost completely digitalized their citizenship. Citizens can do 97% of uh, things uh, uh, online. The only things you cannot do in Estonia is get married and divorced or sell a piece of real estate. Uh, I guess that kind of makes sense, you know, uh, you want to uh, kiss the bride or the groom and you want to see the real estate before you actually buy it. Um, but there are parts of the Estonian success story which are not that successful. So while e-government has been successfully digitalized, e-participation or the Estonian versions of the European Citizens Initiative um, has been going through hiccups. What sets Estonia apart, however, and it's completely different than any other EU member state, that it's the only country which allows for e-voting, so voting in elections online. Uh, and this is something that we can maybe try to uh, push for at the EU level. Um, Gilles said, what are e-participation tools that do not exist? Well, maybe if EU citizens could um, vote online for European Parliament elections, then we wouldn't be afraid before every new EP elections if the turnout will plummet or be lower again, which was luckily not the case in 2019. Okay, this is just a very complicated graph. There is no need to go into detail, but I only want you to see that the European Union has not really moved upwards much in the five years uh, interval uh, portrayed here. Uh, so the use of online consultation and e-voting uh, in this period has not increased much for the EU according to this relevant study. Um, and I foresee that due to the pandemic, uh, this graph will change in the next five year period. What are some of the challenges that also were asked uh, in Slido um, so I was right. Uh, what, are, what is the other side of the medal of e-participation in the EU? First, disinformation. Um, citizens uh, without an adequate level of media literacy can get lost uh, in 
uh, finding the right information which shapes how they participate at the EU level. Another problem is representativeness. So if you look at uh, public consultations, one of the modes that you can participate uh, in uh, EU decision making, um, you will see that even though they are uh, framed as citizen participation, those who take part in them are usually organized interests, private interests, organized civil society, so rarely um, citizens actually directly take part, and I will show you some statistics later on. Another problem is the digital divide. How can we expect that everyone has an equal right to participate digitally in the decision making at the EU level, if not everyone has the same access to internet? Uh, in 2019, I looked up some statistics before uh, we started today. Um, uh, the 85% of Europeans on average use the internet every week, but this changes when you go from one member state to another. It's highest in Denmark, 95%. It's lowest in Bulgaria, 67%. Um, the figures also differ if you look at different age groups. So naturally, you know, people uh, in their uh, teens and 20s are practically born with a smartphone in their hands. Uh, whereas uh, those who are elderly do not maybe even own um, a smartphone, a computer, or something that they can be digitally uh, active with. Two other points, and these are just food for thought so that we can maybe come back to uh, in the discussion part. Seizing the moment, um, I think that the pandemic actually gives us uh, an opportunity of a lifetime for the EU to uh, bridge the gap between the citizens and the union. We are all, at least now in Brussels, where the lockdown is pretty much severe. We are at home, we are glued to our PCs, we wake up and go to sleep um, with uh, our smartphones, and this is the time to actually engage with the citizens. They will never be so present. Our presence is now not physical, so Brussels isn't as uh, uh, far, it is digital. And secondly, I think that uh, just like homeworking, um, e-participation is here to stay. It will not really go back to uh, the old normal before the pandemic. It may not have uh, the intensity it has now, but I think it is here to stay. So these are the, moving on to the second part of the presentation, these are the channels of participation that uh, uh, I put in a list and that uh, Gilles has uh, so nicely covered. Um, so I won't go through them again. If you have any questions, you can ask us um, at any time at, on Slido. I just wanted to give you some snippets of how um, in my previous work as an activist, not as a researcher this time, uh, I have used um, these channels in different projects. So for example, starting with the European um, elections, uh, while I was working in a much smaller organization called the uh, East Foundation, also in Brussels, uh, and while we were uh, involved in a beautiful project uh, that uh, uh, called Trans Europa Caravans, by accidentally, Gosha uh, is present in this call and she was the project manager of this project. Uh, we were teaming up with a bunch of volunteers in 15 different member states involved in uh, mobilizing citizens to vote in the European elections in 2019, uh, organized by This Time I'm Voting, this transnational network of volunteers and activists, which then transformed after the elections into uh, together.eu. Um, and uh, together with them, we were teaming up. So we had our projects, they had their projects. We made events together, which is the essence of Europe for Citizens. You can also do this before the elections um, in, wait, in 2024. Okay. Uh, then European Citizens Initiative. I um, am, well, this is my favorite instrument by far. Uh, it's the most exciting one because it actually is a complete, uh, let's say, uh, in the EU because 
all the agenda setting in the EU usually happens uh, from top down. Someone sits in Brussels or in capitals of member state or big organizations uh, consult with the commission and then the commission has the monopoly of legislative initiative and it will uh, send a proposal to the parliament and the council. Um, so legislation in the EU usually is a stream that goes top down, but the ECI was made uh, precisely with the intention that agenda setting should be also done from the bottom up and EU citizens from at least member state can, uh, let's say, morally oblige the commission to legislate on a matter that we hold dear. Why did I share this image with you? Because the organization I work in... Hislen, in determinados aspectos. Tenemos, eh, eh, colaboramos en la gestión de este foro, eh, ECI, eh, distintos, la resolución de distintos conflictos, etc. Y veis el cuadrado verde. So, um, while I was teaching a course in the spring semester this year um, on EU politics, I invited uh, 20 students to um, discuss the implications of the COVID pandemic on the ECI, and this was published on the ECI forum. So if you want to write a project and you want to have uh, a link with a tool for citizen participation in the EU, uh, you could contact the ECI forum as well and uh, try to discuss a topic pertaining to the ECI and it will be published there and it will be great for your dissemination and outreach. EP petition, also coming back to Trans Europa caravans, we launched a petition for genuine mobility in Europe. Um, one thing just to add on what Gilles said, um, e petitions can actually make a difference and there are many success stories, but um, you are also just one citizen um, in a huge pool of citizens and uh, many of petitions actually get lost in the corridors of the parliament. So you really need to be persistent uh, in order for it to pass the petty committee and actually go to the plenary or something. But um, it's actually, whether it succeeds or not, it's a good idea to also consider launching a petition as a part of your uh, project. Online public consultations are a bit more difficult, as I said, um, designed for citizens, but actually taken over by much more organized groups of interest. You see here a slightly outdated statistics from a report uh, written by ICAS on public uh, consultations. Uh, and uh, you see that the green one represents the citizens. So of all the inputs given in these years, um, up to one quarter were citizens, the rest were, uh, you know, other kinds of organized interest. Um, let me see the time. We are still okay, but I will try to not say too much about the Conference on the Future of Europe, uh, but it is the most exciting uh, mode of e-participation for all of us because it's frustratingly still vague the joint declaration of the institutions, which is supposed to finally give us the final word on how the conference will look, is still pending, if I'm not wrong. Um, yeah, so we still don't know the details, but whatever you've read about the structure of the conference is just the tip of the iceberg. I'll explain in a second. So this conference is not the one-off event, so the conference word might be misleading. It's a two-year period where um, a whole ecosystem is supposed to be provided for not just the EU, but a lot of civil society organizations in many member states to allow citizens to be creative and try to uh, have their say on the future of Europe. It's supposed to be a transnational festival of democracy. So all those agoras, you know, the youth agora and different agoras which will be organized, that's just at the top. But what the commission wants... Enough. Can I, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I think we are now already anticipating on Daniela's presentation. Okay, okay. So, no, I, um, I don't yeah. know, maybe you can say a few sentences to, to close for now, and then we will tackle the questions we, yes. we have received. And okay. uh, 
after this, we, we will start with the, the conference. Okay, so let me just uh, not go into the conference on the future of Europe anymore, but I'll just uh, on this ecosystem. So a wider web of activities around the conference, which you can base your projects on. Since it will be a two year period, whenever the next call comes, you still can uh, count on the conference to be active and you can uh, base your uh, transnational project on that. Just to give you an example of ECAS, I crossed over best practices because we've submitted Euro for Citizen uh, projects which are still pending, so I cannot know if they are good or bad. But for example, we have a project around something called the European Hub for uh, Citizen Engagement, which is a digital hub which allows uh, civil society organizations across Europe to digitally help each other out. Um, and uh, voila, that's one example. A second example is that uh, we want to cr uh, crowdsource citizen opinions in different member states on air quality. And all of this can be nicely tied up with the conference on the future of Europe. Okay, uh, the last slide I have for you is actually what you can do either digitally or in person uh, prior to, during and after the project uh, in order to amplify your uh, voice in the EU prior to the project. Anyhow, you have to build a network of CSOs because you have to have partners from different states, but don't just stick to those partners, build a wider network of those you usually work with, involve your national contact points, contact Europe Direct, contact the rep office of the commission or the parliament early on. Also, build up the momentum of the event before because some of those events you will have organized anyhow, right? Um, don't just do this for the sake of the dissemination uh, dimension of the project. Uh, link up with existing EU events and the events of your and other organizations. During the implementation of your project, um, already have a ready list of friendly media and just compile as many pics, videos for the consumption on your social media. Always try to contact in order to increase this European and transnational dimension, contact the relevant EU institution uh, by either looking at the organogram of the institution or go to who is who in the EU website in order to find out who you should write to. Look up your MEP simply uh, don't just uh, consider the European dimension of your future project as something you have to tick in a checkbox in order to get the project it's actually truly important to um, have it throughout the implementation. Uh, another trick that we have found useful is always to see which country is going to preside over the council in the coming period. You always know the next three uh, because then you can incorporate this into your project. You can, for example, uh, have Slovenia as an incoming uh, presiding uh, member state. Uh, and since you know Slovenia is going to preside, you get a partner organization from Slovenia so that you can then directly contact the presiding country with you know, the results of your project or to invite them to your event, etc. cetera. Um, now, I can't really read what it says here. Prepare the groundwork for your output geared towards the institutions. Uh, and always know that in case you wanna do some of the events in Brussels, um, the European Economic and Social Committee or somewhere else, the local EC and EP office will give you free um, venues for your events. There is no time to cover what to do after the project and we can discuss it in um, the um, right now. To conclude, um, ECAS has a crowdsourcing platform and we're just about to um, press close on two crowdsourcing exercises which involve uh, the impact of the pandemic on mobile EU citizens and the impact of the pandemic on CSOs involved with the defense of EU citizens' rights. Um, I'm just monopolizing this space here to tell you that I might share the links for these uh, two uh, surveys with you in case you are interested. Here is my contact and um, thank you so much for your attention.
the most trending one, it reads, will e-participation not exclude the older generations to build the biggest population group in most EU countries? Very quickly, that, that's a tricky one. Accessibility has been uh, mentioned by, by Peter. Um, it's a permanent endeavor, let's say. Huh? We are um, trying to be as accessible as, um, as possible. Uh, for instance, for the Europe for Citizens project through the national contact point, you know, a kind of uh, familiar face, national, uh, uh, national um, face to, uh, to European uh, initiatives. And, uh, and that's the trend for, for many, uh, many projects, many uh, proje programs, let's say for the information bit, the, the European Union strives to inform at the local level through the network of the Europe Direct uh, Info Point. So uh, going local uh, as much as possible. And uh, for, for the, uh, the digital, let's say the divide, digital uh, gap, I have no, um, let's say, silver bullet. Uh, in mind, but probably one of the elements is not to count only on e-participation, uh, but also to to count on uh, traditional participation too. Uh, uh, we we have uh, we support projects that are very uh, traditional. To uh, let's say our town twinnings, for instance, are a, a good old style, uh, you know, town hall uh, events that gather uh, people. And, uh, and can be a way of, uh, of bridging the, the digital gap. So maybe we can, we can say that the best e-participation instruments, they always also include, um, let's say, physical uh, ways of, of participation to, to broaden the participation. Peter, I'm, I'm sure this um, second question is for you. Is more e-participation the chance for some kind of direct democracy as successfully practiced, for example, in Switzerland? It reminds me of your remark about uh, e-voting on the on the EU level. Now, what is your view? Uh, to what extent can we go into the direction of direct democracy? Yeah, um, it's a difficult question. <laughs> it's a difficult question because uh, Switzerland has a centuries-long tradition of direct democracy, and people there like to throw referendums. Um, for all kinds of things, whereas in some member states you have a completely different political culture. So not all parts of the EU will uh, react equally to uh, what other I personally might endorse, which is more direct democracy. Um, however, um, as long as we have better uh, and more access to agenda setting, to um, consultations, etc. So uh, as long as we are at least in the middle ground, so if we don't have actual decision-making power in all instances, uh, let's at least avoid to just have uh, the power to passively get information from the institutions. So I am, if I had to, you know, in terms of the three functions, um, monitoring, agenda setting and decision-making, uh, I know that the realistic option uh, is to increase the ability of the citizens to agenda set and to be consulted. Um, I am not disclosing, I'm not uh, discounting a possibility of EU-wide referendums. In fact, those would be great, but uh, not for all topics because as Brexit has taught us, the referendums have a wicked way of uh, reducing complex topics to just yes or no answers, and that can sometimes be dangerous. Excellent. In any case, I mean, the most, uh, one of the pressing questions remains, how can we widen participation and how can we um, motivate also more people to participate, maybe uh, in more regular ways? Mm -hmm. And um, maybe before anticipating on our final discussion, this could, some of the, the responses to this question could be given now by Daniela, I think, who will be speaking uh, on ab about the, the conference on the on the future of Europe. Yes, thank you, Philip, and, and thank you for the, the invitation and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniela Vancic. I work for Democracy International. We're based here in Cologne, Germany. 
where we promote specifically direct democracy at all levels of participation. Uh, so it's actually perfect that I'm the third speaker because I'm speaking about all the points that have already been, been touched upon briefly. Um, but I want to speak about two points specifically. Uh, the first about an existing tool, um, that's the European Citizens Initiative, but to build on what has already just been said and to look at uh, the, the ECI forum in more detail as a support tool uh, for organizers. And um, as a second um, point, a not yet existing tool or opportunity, let's call it, uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe, which we've mentioned a few times already tonight. Um, now about the first point, well, we, we don't have real direct democracy in the EU yet. Um, we do have something very close and that's the European Citizens Initiative, which uh, in its founding is inspired by the Swiss tools of direct democracy. Um, and it's true that nothing like this exists anywhere else in the world, um, not on the transnational level for sure. It, it truly is unique, um, but as you might have heard, it's not always easy to run an initiative. Uh, just this morning, uh, actually at a session of ECI week, we were discussing the, the best tips and practices on online campaigning for an ECI, uh, especially given the, the current situation. You can't really go out on the street and, and collect signatures <laughs> or go to events anymore. Um, but even before COVID, running a transnational campaign and using a tool that is um, unfortunately not so well known by the general European public, it definitely poses its challenges. So uh, first I want to talk about a support infrastructure tool of the ECI, and that's the ECI forum. Um, and I'll talk about some of the support features it offers for current organizers or even future organizers or people who are just uh, thinking of, of launching an initiative or just simply interested in the, the process itself. Um, but just quickly about um, what our role is on this forum and a bit about uh, its history. Um, we as Democracy International are subcontracted under ECAS actually to carry out uh, certain parts of the forum. Um, so it is an official website of the European Union, but it has NGO support in the content management and organizer support side. So in the background, it's, it's NGOs who are, um, who are kept keeping this, this uh, website alive. Uh, it was last year a pilot project, um, and as of January 1st of this year, it was fully implemented. Um, as part of the new regulation of the ECI. Um, the regulation are like the rules of the game for how to campaign. Um, and uh, the new regulation says that the, the commission will set up an online collaborative platform is what it's called uh, of the ECI. And that's exactly what um, we received here as part of a support package to campaigners. That's what we have now, the ECI forum. So um, we as civil society organizations that are involved with the ECI for a very long time, actually the very founding of Democracy International is in, in the ECI. Um, we have wanted to see something like this for a very long time, a, a platform where all current or former or even future organizers can gather and, and exchange ideas. So this is the homepage of, of, um, of the forum. This website is, is of course available in every official language of the EU. Um, the screenshot that Petar just showed you was from the pilot project. As you can see, it received a little bit of a, a glow up since then. So um, it does look a little bit more campaigner friendly, which is exactly what, what we need to uh, support for, for campaigners. Um, this is the homepage, um, um, just the basic homepage things. At the, at the bottom we have blogs. These are opinion pieces by different writers. Sometimes they are current organizers who are making um, a case for their idea. Uh, sometimes um, about the ECI uh, as a tool itself, um, calling for a reform of the ECI, as we can see here. Um, some offer tips or advice for current organizers. I wrote this blog piece here. Um, and if, if you're going to want to know about initiatives specifically, which ones are currently running and which initiatives you can sign right now, you'll want to go to the official register of the ECI page. You can always find that if you scroll all the way to the bottom. So this is the official then um, the website. That's where then you, the, you can get all, all that information actually sign ECIs. But this page is, is for, um, for organizers or potential organizers, people who just want to get more information um, from an organizational or campaigning point of view. Um, this feature here, Learn, is where you can get, uh, as soon as it loads, this is where you can get all of your, your how-tos, um, your guidance notes, um, webinars on, on different topics of the ECI. Um, they're also archived here, so you can always visit this page to learn about the ECI generally as a tool, uh, about uh, 
what campaigning for an ECI entails, what are you going to get yourself into, <laughs> because it's going to be a long and possibly expensive year for campaigning um, and those sorts of things. Uh, there are also success stories that, that you can read here uh, about the successes that four um, successful ECIs have followed, uh, their strategies um, to reach the one million signatures in one year. Uh, more will be added here soon as of just of recently. As of this year, um, two more initiatives have submitted and verified their signatures. So this will be updated um, and discussed. This was also briefly mentioned by, by Petar. Um, this is really like the forum part of the forum. Um, here you can propose a discussion topic. Uh, perhaps you have an idea for an ECI and just want to test uh, the waters a bit with the ECI community. You can do that here and say, um, hey, I have an initiative idea about um, free movement, uh, for example, as we see here, you can ask, what do you all think about it? Would you, who would want to support this with me? Um, and for this feature, you to, to be able to post um, and to comment, you would have to create a form account and be logged in, but um, that's free and easy to do. It's just a, just a registration. Um, and then the connect feature, uh, this is the, the section where you can, well, literally, as it says, connect with the different users. Um, maybe you saw that they, they posted something in the discuss section. You want to ask them about their campaign. Um, maybe you saw they posted a blog article and you, you, you want to follow up with them on this. So this is a really great way to, to connect with other experts in a, a certain field that you're looking into. Uh, this is also a good feature because when you, when you launch an initiative, you will um, need to have a group of seven organizers to launch with. Um, and these names have to be submitted to the European Commission along with your proposal. So you're essentially launching as a group of, of campaigners. And so you can use this feature, for example, to find those other campaigners or organizers. Um, for this, you will also would have to register. And now um, this seek advice, this is in my opinion, probably uh, the most practical feature offered. If you are um, getting ready to launch an initiative or maybe you've already launched and you need some advice, um, you can consult the forum. You can uh, ask your question through a, a form here and receive expert tailor-made uh, advice on campaigning, fundraising, or uh, legal advice. And you'll receive that within about a week. Uh, this has been used um, 36 times just now in, in, in 2020 alone. And remember, we were doing this last year as a pilot project too. So um, this is actually inspired by a service that Democracy International and ECAS and uh, Initiative and Referendum Institute were offering for years to, to ECI uh, organizers, um, but now we've just officialized it. So um, those are the major features behind the ECI forum. Again, um, just such a unique, a unique tool like the ECI would really require this kind of channel and platform in order to build a community around this tool. And it's really great that something like this now finally uh, exists. So I will stop sharing my screen here. Okay. Um, so that's, that, that was the first point. Um, now uh, I want to switch the focus completely <laughs> to a totally different point. Uh, we, we just talked about the, the, the ECI, which is, of, of course, existing right now. Uh, it's a right of all EU citizens. Um, but I want to talk about a participatory opportunity that um, should just as equally interest and excite all European citizens. Uh, and that's the conference on the future of Europe that has been mentioned a few times already tonight. Um, so a little bit of the background of, of this conference um, and what makes it so so exciting. Uh, this was announced last year by uh, Commission President uh, von der Leyen um, in her political guidelines that a conference on the future of Europe would be uh, set up, would launch on Europe Day 2020, so on, on May 9th, and run for two years. Um, and this would be all done as a, as a push for a new European democracy, where, where citizens would be um, called equal partners in discussing the future of Europe with uh, decision makers. And um, what's more is that she said discussions at this conference would, um, could include topics that would require treaty change. And this is um, big news in the EU institutions as the, the words treaty change were, um, were really avoided at all costs. I mean, nobody wanted to open the, uh, the, the Pandora's box of the bureaucracy and the complicated <laughs> legalities that would come with treaty change. Um, and while this conference is not the route for treaty change directly, it's not a uh, Article 48 convention process, 
but what it could be is it could be a catalyst for for treaty change um, an example um, it could be that an outcome of the conference would be that in order to re reach results uh, X, Y, and Z, whatever the conference uh, agrees, that we will need treaty change for it. And then uh, the institutions might launch an official treaty change process in according to Article 48. So this was really exciting for, for us at, at Democracy uh, International, as we've been calling for a treaty change process, at least a review into the, the current treaties. Um, we've for years now and we we like the fact that citizens would be brought in as equal partners in co-creating potentially maybe a new treaty for um, for the EU uh, this excited many other civil society organizations as well um, and especially that this was going to be the flagship project of um, this uh, commission uh, but uh, as a few months went on um, and there was no more news and very little movement on, on the topic. Um, each in institution was preparing their own position on the, on the conference and how um, the conference should run. For example, treaty change was not that welcomed by the, co the council. And then of course the pandemic hit. So needless, needless to say that the conference on the future of Europe did not begin on May 9th, 2020 uh, on Europe day as expected. Um, but it wasn't so much because of the pandemic, but mostly because the, the institutions couldn't come to an agreement on how the conference should be run and who should be the chair or the president of the conference and the details like that. So um, all these civil society organizations that were looking forward to this conference, um, we, we came together and we, we formed what uh, is called uh, the Citizens Take Over Europe Coalition. Um, we are also campaigning that essentially we're advocating for a citizens-centered conference on the future of Europe, um, the one that was promised to us last year. Um, and we've been a really active coalition since March. Um, we are now about 50 organizations that have uh, focused on advocacy and policy monitoring while also making our positions known on how the conference on the future of Europe should run. Um, we have some experts on citizens' participation in our coalition. And we have, uh, since then, we have also launched an open letter to Angela Merkel, as, as Germany has the current uh, EU Council Presidency, and to all three institutions. Um, we have also published a 10-point guiding principles document about how a citizens-focused conference should be run. Um, so democratic, transparent, accountable, and so on. And more recently, we have also um, launched an official petition to the European Parliament, and we're re um, just waiting for a response um, there now. Um, we've also had a few events. Our first kickoff event was on, on Europe Day, uh, the original date that the, the conference should have started. And we will now um, have our next event beginning of December, where we will have also a self-organized uh, public hearing on the petition that we submitted to the parliament, um, since there's been quite a bit of a delay there. So we're taking that up in, in, in our own hands and doing like a self-organized mock uh, public hearing where we're still inviting all of the, the members of the, the Petit Committee of the European Parliament. Uh, so in the, the very first Slido poll that we were, um, we were shown uh, on which instruments of EU participation have used so far, um, just as a, as a new coalition with Citizens Take Over Europe, we have um, access uh, six of these instruments or, or methods listed. Um, of course, the easy ones, the exchange with, with MEPs, um, we, we invited them to speak at our events, but we also had many exchanges with them and many MEPs are fully supportive of um, civil society's push for a democratic and transparent conference on the future of Europe, um, contacting the institutions, uh, of course, accessing documents. Um, as far as public consultation, we have not accessed this because there was no public consultation launched on, on the conference. Um, but what we're actually doing is creating our own uh, online public consultation on how the conference should be run uh, in order to crowdsource ideas and, and to gather some, um, some input. We think that the, the institutions should actually launch an online public consultation before starting the conference. Um, there are public consultations on all sorts of issues, which is, which is really great. But then it should definitely launch a consultation on a on a conference which is meant to involve citizens at the at the very core. So um, uh, this is something that is would be really a missed opportunity if there's no public consultation loss from from the the institutions on, on this. Um, but that's why we're we're doing this as an initiative of, of civil society. Um, also, what we've used is petitions to the European Parliament, as, as mentioned, um, that was also on the list in, in our poll. Um, so we've just launched that about last last month. Um, and the, the last one was the conference on the future of Europe. We'll, 
yes, of course, this didn't start yet, but we are uh, advocating for it ahead of its implementation and making sure that at least in, in this phase where we're talking about how the conference should be run or that's being done by the institutions, that it, at least that they will be um, co-designing that with citizens. That's really what we're calling for at this point is co-design the conference with citizens. Um, we have all this time citizens are, are at home. Um, we're uh, reachable digitally, as, as was mentioned also by Petar. And so this would be really the perfect opportunity to, to co-design with citizens and consult the citizens on, on how to run this conference that could be really historic for Europe. Um, so just as um, some, some final words on, on the conference, it's, it's true, no one knows yet how it will look like or how the conference will run or what structure it will have exactly. Um, but if it's, if it's going to be a real attempt to bring in citizens into the decision-making process, then it really offers a, a unique opportunity for, for citizens to be on the same playing field as the European institutions and to really design the future of Europe that we want from a citizen's perspective and civil society uh, support behind it. So um, that's, uh, that's it for now and I look forward to your questions. Wow, amazing, uh, Daniela, thanks a lot. Um, this actually reminds me of the very last question that we received uh, after Peter's presentation, where uh, somebody anonymous asked us if uh, e-participation didn't actually make it necessary to further decentralize the institutions. Uh, which would bring the union closer to, to its citizens. Uh, if you could imagine now in, in a minute uh, your, I don't know, your, your perfect uh, conference on the future of Europe, would it actually include um, possibilities for, for citizens to, for example, physically also participate in their cities? Um, how, could we, how would it look like if it, if it was a painting, let's say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, per a perfect conference in the future of Europe would be hybrid, actually would take part also in person because nothing really beats that face to face uh, interaction and for something that will be so transnational. Um, that'd be really great to have that. What we also advocate for, and this is also in the, the opinion of the European Parliament, um, these agoras that were mentioned uh, also by Petar. So these would be, um, these could be like randomly selected citizens agoras, um, random selection by, by sortition, just like done um, in Ireland for the Irish Citizens Assemblies, for example, in France for the, the climate assemblies. Um, and as a coalition with Citizens Take Over Europe, we're really a fan of, of random selection. This is a great way to bring people who are maybe not so involved in the political sphere from all corners of Europe to bring them together, to meet face to face, to discuss uh, the future of Europe that we want to, to learn also more about Europe. Um, I think you can't beat that face to face um, contact, but of course that's not possible right now and that's um, I'm totally realistic about that. That's why now is the time to really launch at least the digital point uh, part of it. So it should be run hybrid. Um, like right now since it's the conference has not started, we are at um, what a, uh, about eight month delay since the original start date or so. Um, now is really the time to let's let's put it on pause then. We don't need to rush it, but let's do it well. Um, so let's co-design it. How should this look like? Even the in-person meetings, even the, the hybrid meetings, um, the, the online meetings, how should this look like? And let's do that also with the citizens and design it. Great. Uh, we do have another anonymous and maybe more cautious uh, statement pending here on Slido. Uh, saying is equal participation for politicians as professionals and citizens really possible and desirable given the dangers that Peter mentioned before would like yeah. to uh, react on this one right of, of course I mean it's with the political will it's possible <laughs> it just we have to have that political will um, and it, it it all depends on the structure of this conference. So there needs to be a constant feedback loop. Um, of course, the citizens can't write the legal language. And, and oftentimes also the politicians don't write the legal, legal language. It's the, the experts then who are writing that in, in behind the scenes. What we mean with, with equal partners, these are actually the words of, of Commissioner um, President von der Leyen, but um, what we also want to see with equal partners is that there's a constant feedback loop to citizens. So if there's going to be, let's say, 
um, let's imagine there will be a conference plenary, and this is where um, then the politicians meet, the decision makers, and that things kind of have to be fed through through them and they have filtered through them, that at the end, everything is still also approved by the citizens at, at every step. So we don't want just citizens involved at one step for a discussion round, one agora, and then go home, but involve citizens at every step. And then at the end, whatever final decision is taken, here's the final uh, report or outcome of the conference, let those citizens also approve that too, because they were part of the, the process, so we don't want to keep them out. It's just constantly having this feedback loop and bringing citizens in at, at every stage. No, yeah, I no. basically I w just want to agree with everything Daniela said. I think that it's really important to have this uh, feedback loop back to the citizens. It's the citizen conference on the future of Europe, so we shouldn't let it be hijacked by uh, politicians. Um, and we also, although I did mention those uh, words of caution, I wouldn't want them to paralyze your, uh, your um, will to be creative and brave and uh, audacious and take part in decision making. So what we actually need is uh, to be uh, literate, digitally literate, um, to be aware of possibilities that someone might uh, uh, use this conference to filter some personal agenda ideas and then just jump into it and, and be active citizens, yeah. As an EU official, but still, you know, uh, working on supporting projects uh, uh, on, on democratic participation is I would say that the um, the impact uh, that uh, EU citizens can have is really proportionate to the uh, to the energy, to the uh, creativity that that they will put uh, in the uh, conference on the future of Europe. The the last European elections have shown, I believe, that. Uh, civic engagement can make a difference. You know, before the elections, everybody was fearing, you know, low turnout and also the turnout uh, and the results of the, uh, of the elections. But we've seen um, a huge mobilization uh, by civil society, organized civil society. So it is often mediated by, uh, by organizations. Let's say it's not, not necessarily individual mobilization, but that makes a difference. And, and that would be the same for for the conference of, on the future of Europe. I would say that if if citizens let um, politicians, uh, uh, elected officials, uh, the the leaders uh, work alone, you know they will they will work alone. But if if you have a strong um, a strong engagement in this, it, it would be uh, unwise and impossible for elected officials to to not take into account what uh, what will come out of um, of that mobilization and and now uh, the e-participation tools and others that we have main, mentioned they do they do level the the playing field between uh, between politicians and um, and citizens or organized uh, civil society uh, it's uh, it's much more difficult for um, for elected officials to to ignore uh, what uh, what comes out of uh, of the civil society nowadays. Nobody would like. I could, to I could start. Yeah, yeah. just I mean, um, just just to quickly wrap up. I think there there are a lot of opportunities already out there that are existing. There are even some that are not existing yet that are coming up. Opportunities for citizens' participation, which I think offer a lot of promise and a lot of things to be excited for, but they only work and democracy only works when people take part. Um, so that means we, uh, we all need to reach out to our networks. We need to make sure that we keep these tools alive. The ECI itself only works when a lot of people use it. Um, that will then also in the end put more uh, pressure on the institutions to keep a, keep a high standard and to continue to, to respond um, to these tools and to respond to the citizens' uh, requests. Um, so I would say just keep at it and Democracy uh, needs people. Uh, I just want to thank you all for listening. The numbers uh, of participants shows that people are actually intrigued and uh, 
uh, want to get on the bandwagon of e-participation. I personally cannot wait for the lockdown to end and to be able to go and protest in person. Uh, but in the meanwhile, uh, let's all try to get accustomed to being digital citizens. Um, and yeah, the um, the policy agenda is full at the, at the union level. You know, on the international scene, uh, the uh, it is fast moving. Uh, we've got you know climate change. We we are at the beginning of um, of a budget uh, cycle that. Uh, uh, beginning of a new mandate of the EU institutions. So let's say now that we've all gotten used to uh, to electronic tools, thanks to the the, the pandemic, more than ever, I think e-participation uh, should be uh, should be used by uh, by all citizens to um, to make uh, the European democracy alive.